And I'm told you have to speak into the microphone when you're speaking, so we're going to just shift it back. There we go. So that Jack can hear you. Okay. Jack, can you hear us? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, welcome uh, everyone to the Brecht Forum. I want to uh, first say uh, uh, thank you everyone for coming out on this uh, beginning of winter in New York City uh, and on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, my name is Nikhil Singh and I teach in the departments of social and cultural analysis and history at New York University. And I'm, I'm also the editor of um, the, the book that we are here to both celebrate the publication of and also to discuss, uh, Climbing Jacob's Ladder, the Black Freedom Movement Writings of Jack O'Dell. Uh, and we've, we've dubbed this event as a book party and also as a forum, and I think that's fitting uh, because in some ways um, the book is a representation of the culmination of a life's work, the life of Jack O'Dell, uh, a, a life that is incredibly important to such a wide range of social movements and struggles for social justice. Um, and yet it is also a, a book that uh, seeks to uh, point uh, the ways forward. So it is not just a book that is about a recovery of a past, but also about a, a thinking about the kinds of futures that we want to achieve in our own work. Um, uh, I uh, came to this work myself when I was working on my first book, Black is a Country, and I started coming across these essays um, by a man named J.H. O'Dell. Uh, and these essays had amazing titles like Colonialism and the Negro Experience, The Foundations of Racism in American Life, uh, and Climbing Jacob's Ladder, The Life and Times of the Freedom Movement. And I would read these essays, and they're essays full of analytical brilliance, um, incredibly astounding historical breadth and learning, and I just wondered who, who was this Jack Odell, actually this J.H. Odell, who was this figure? Um, and I started researching Jack a little bit at that point in time, but as a struggling assistant professor trying to get his first book done, of course I let that thread drop and in some sense redoubled an error that exists within the historiography of the civil rights movement and particularly the historiography of the left within the civil rights movement in which Jack O'Dell is not a figure who is widely discussed or known despite the fact that he is important to almost every single movement that touched the civil rights movement and despite the fact that so many of us have been touched by his work over time. In, uh, 19, uh, in 2005, just through serendipity, uh, I had the opportunity to rectify or to begin to rectify the error, at least in my own work and my own thinking, when I uh, was invited to Jack's 80th birthday party in Vancouver, BC, where he now lives and where he is Skyping uh, today from. And I was able to um, begin to speak with him about the possibility of doing a collaboration. And Jack and I can talk more in the Q&A maybe about the nature of the collaboration, but I'm told that we will have someone from Blue Stockings here later to sell copies of the book. So I hope that you will all um, consider uh, taking a closer look at, the, at, the, at what we have actually been able to put together. Um, uh, before we start, there are a number of thank yous that are in order. Uh, first, I want to thank the Brecht Forum for hosting this event and for providing the technology that allows us to bring Jack O'Dell back to New York City for the first time in a long time, a city that Jack has spent, uh, spent many, many years doing uh, amazingly important work. Uh, and we only wish, Jack, that you could be with us in person, but this is a, a, just a wonderful treat for so many of us. Secondly, I'd like to thank um, Karen Ferguson, uh, who is with Jack in, uh, in Vancouver today, helping to arrange the, the Skype feed from the other side. Uh, I'd like to thank Liz Mestris from the Brecht Forum, who uh, helped organize the event. And most of all, I'd like to thank Van Goss, who's here in the audience today, uh, without whom I don't think this event would have happened. Van, Van really pushed, pushed me to get, to get moving, to, to, to pull things together, and, and also suggested that we invite Bill to join us. Um, today. 
Um, so I'm just going to say a couple of words of introduction about Jack Codell, and then I'm going to introduce um, our other speaker today, uh, Bill Fletcher. As many of you know, Jack Odell is a legendary organizer whose career spans the National Maritime Union in the 1940s, uh, the Communist Party underground in the South in the 1950s, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, uh, where he served as uh, a de facto executive director for many years uh, in the early 60s, and then Freedom Ways, where he served as an associate managing editor for almost two decades. Uh, Jack went on to work in the Rainbow Push campaigns of the 1970s and 80s, serving as Jesse Jackson's Director of International Affairs, and Jack continues to be active as an organizer, as a thinker, as an educator in so many ways in Vancouver, in Seattle, in the Pacific Northwest, where he works with many different organizations um, in the present day. Um, his key essays and writings are brought together in Climbing Jacob's Ladder, along with a number of organizational documents that have never been published before, which uh, illuminate some of his work as an organizer, as a movement builder. And one of the things we wanted to do in the book was to capture both sides of Jack as an intellectual, as an activist, as someone who's thinking expansively about ideas um, and the structures of thought, and someone who's also thinking expansively about social change and the structures we need to achieve that kind of change. Um, so, um, I'm sure that we will, we will be happy to talk about the book um, at certain points in this conversation. Uh, since I've interviewed Jack so many times over the years, um, we, were, we were just thrilled when Bill Fletcher agreed to join us today um, and to actually take on the role of interlocutor uh, for Jack in this discussion. And um, I will moderate uh, throughout the course of the afternoon um, Bill Fletcher is a racial justice international and labor activist and writer. He is a senior scholar currently with the Institute for Policy Studies um, and the immediate past president of Trans Africa Forum. I think it's no exaggeration to say that Bill Fletcher is, is one of the most important uh, labor intellectuals and activists of our time. Uh, someone whose writings have influenced many of us and someone who, much like Jack O'Dell, has worked continuously and tirelessly in, in and across a wide range of movements that have been crucial to keeping alive the possibilities of, uh, of, 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 of progressive and radical politics in a very, very difficult period. He's most recently the co-author with Fernando Gasparin of Solidarity Divided, The Crisis in Organized Labor, and A New Path Towards Social Justice, a very excellent and important book, also published by the University of California Press, which I, which I highly recommend that people read. So I'm not going to take up any more time. Um, I want to just um, uh, begin, begin the conversation now um, by, and we'll, we'll sort of try to manage back and forth by looking at the camera, but by keeping you also there, Jack. Um, I want to begin by asking Bill and asking Jack um, if you could each say uh, just a few words about how you two know each other, because I know you've known each other and admired each other for many, many years, and, um, and maybe this will just be a way to, to start this as a conversation. I know that Bill has prepared a number of questions that he wants to pose, um, and so we'll, 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 we'll turn it over to Bill then to ask questions. Jack, you'll give whatever kinds of answers, and this will hopefully develop into a conversation. And then by the end of, of you know, maybe 45 minutes to an hour, we'll, we'll turn it over to the audience for your questions and comments, and, and hopefully turn this into more of a conversation. So. Thank you. Good afternoon, and hey, Jack. Um, hey, buddy. So uh, this is like delightful. Um, but I, I want to say before I say, answer your question, Nikhil, that uh, I, I also want to thank Van, because if Van hadn't been such a pain, <laughs> this really wouldn't have happened. I mean, he was just like relentless. You are going to come to New York and do this. Um, so this is, this is fantastic. So, I believe that Jack and I met in 1990 when I moved to Washington, D.C. 
and I was working for the Mail Handlers Union, and I was working with a guy named Gene Gruskin, who lived in the same apartment building as Jack and Jane. And I had, of course, known of Jack for years, and I had remembered reading something that Jack wrote in The Black Scholar in, I think it was 87, 88, uh, called Toward a Rainbow Presidency in 2000. And, um, and so I had heard a great deal, and it was, it was this movement icon. And it's interesting when you meet an icon, uh, because they can either, they often can either be less than what you expected, or much more, and he was much more, actually. I mean, as, as, as much as I looked up to him, I found him to be a very down-to-earth, cool guy. And, uh, and, and I've looked at him as a, as a mentor. And it was only recently, and Jack knows this, that I found out that he was the age that he is. Because I, you, know, you look at Jack and you think he's a great-looking guy for his mid to late 60s. And to find out that he's in his 80s, You know, it's just, it, it, was, it was actually, I found it very inspiring. So this is, this is a real treat. Jack? Jack, would you like to say a few words? Um, would I like to say? Yes, I, I've been given go, okay. <laughs> well, um. I'm very delighted to have this opportunity uh, to get together with Brother Bill Fetcher and Nikhil Singh um, on this uh, occasion and to have a chance to talk with all of you. Um, this is a, a very important moment for me. It's such a long time that I haven't been in New York. And I too want to join in thanking Brother Van Goss. I had the pleasure of being out at his school a few years ago. Uh, and having a chance to meet him and his wife and lecture at his class. And so this is, this is just a, a real treat, and I feel that I'm very, very lucky to have the chance to participate, and I thank all of you for uh, being there at the Brett Center uh, for us to be able to have this conversation. So, um, Jack, we're going to start... I, I... The questions I have are sort of, they begin in the 1950s, then move to the present. Um, and I was thinking about you and your relationship to SELC and to Dr. King. And so my question is basically this. Um, you have been an unapologetic leftist for most of your life. And when you started working with SELC and Dr. King, how familiar were they, and particularly King, with your political history? And, and what did he and others say? And did you find any, uh, I mean, was there any red baiting early on? No, uh, there, was no there was no red baiting. Um, Dr. King uh, and I met uh, through a letter that I wrote him uh, when they were going to have um, a youth march for integrated schools in 1959. And I happen to have uh, been, uh, just a year earlier, uh, had, had a period of being uh, director of an insurance company, a protective insurance company in Birmingham, Alabama, and in Montgomery. And so I wrote him and told him I heard about the youth march, and uh, I, I knew the area fairly well. Uh, and I was willing to uh, be one of the volunteers to organize the youth march in the South because this was a partition, a petition campaign as well as a march that Bayard Rustin was leading. So um, I volunteered to do this work, and, to, and I, in that course of that, uh, I, I mentioned that I was a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, which I knew he was a member of, and um, that um, I was going to travel the, the various uh, campuses in the South and circulate this petition and if, if they wanted me to do so. So they, they hired me for that purpose. Uh, he might have known that I had been uh, a 
uh, summoned by the House on american Activities Committee uh, in Atlanta the year earlier, along with Carl Braden and another other people. But I, I, don't, I don't know that to be a fact. Uh, we didn't discuss anything other than the march was coming up. Uh, it was very important because of the situation in the South, the resistance to the Supreme Court decision uh, 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 on, on education the growth of the white citizens councils and so forth. So this march was a petition, a march and petition campaign to answer the white citizen councils and the others that were attempting to frustrate them. And um, that was the extent of the communication before I was asked to take that responsibility. What would you, um, what would you say about Dr. King's leadership style? Um, you seem to have great admiration for him one of the things I've always been intrigued with is leaders and how they build teams or don't build teams. So what would you say about his leadership style? Um, was he successful, in your opinion, in building a leadership team? But also, so what happened after he died or after he was murdered? Why was the leadership unable to hold together? Uh, Dr. King's leadership style was uh, one of uh, great respect for his for, for his colleagues and, and his, on his team. Uh, he uh, inquired of them what their when he was thinking of a particular project or launching. He 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 invited their participation. Uh, as a teacher, he was he had that great attitude of being a good listener. Uh, and his conclusions uh, that he would decide upon was based upon the listening that he did from his staff because he knew that his staff uh, had a body of experience and, uh, and, and were dedicated. So and I, I found that very interesting. It was not a top-down. He made the final decision on activities that we would undertake, but uh, the fact is that uh, his leadership style was one that um, invited he would throw up an idea that he was just thinking about doing and then even raise some objections that he had heard. And he would listen to all of us and then he would make a decision. And one of the things I, I would say about his leadership style is that uh, Dr. King was a Hegelian. Uh, and that, that's very important because he understood the dialectic of uh, life. And uh, he used to say all the time about this anti-communist thing, he said, well, you know, I'm not, a, I, I can't join the Marxists or the communists because I believe in God, and Marx did not. But he said Marx wrote, wrote the greatest critique of capitalism ever written. But as a Hegelian, uh, Dr. King was very clear uh, of the contradictions in life and how one must deal with them in the process of deciding uh, where you want to go in a given situation. I think that was a very valuable quality of his uh, because he enabled us to uh, to look at both sides of a question or all sides of a question if there was more than two and to uh, and to bring together a synthesis that would possibly be the best answer to what we were about to undertake so what happened in 68 why um, what happened to this leadership team that he assembled of some very brilliant people. Well, I wasn't on, I wasn't with Dr. King at that time, as you know. I, I had, had been forced to resign uh, by, by the FBI and the Kennedy administration since 63. Um, but I'm, I used to see Andy Young and, um, and others from time to time, Stoney Cooks and others. And so, you know, I followed their work because I was interested. I continue to be interested. And um, that, that was a, a blow to all of us, his assassination, even though we know that uh, he, had faced, uh, he had faced threats to his life all the time that he was in the leadership. I think, I think you would say that um, the leadership team was traumatized because even though uh, the movement faced danger consistently, you don't, you're not ready for that type of attack. Mm. Uh, 
um, we, we, we relied upon our nonviolent uh, protests and organization uh, to be understood in such a way that we were not threatening anyone, but we were determined to be free from the segregation system. Dr. King, as we all know, was um, um, a, a promoter and an articulate expressor of nonviolent direct action. And so we should have been prepared, you might say, for the opposite to take place, but we thought that, uh, you know, that the danger might pass because people would see uh, the value of this nonviolent process as an affirmation of the democracy that we cherish. But, we, but he was taken from us. And um, the trauma was such, was mixed with also a commitment to go on with his work. The trauma was what brought us sadness and um, unexpected sorrow, but it was also reinforced our determined to carry on. And so you recall, many of you, that uh, the Poor People's Campaign was uh, organized as a response for Poor People's Campaign to Washington. And all of the team members got on board for uh, organizing uh, a mass pilgrimage to Washington to address the problem of poverty. Since Dr. King was assassinated in the course of his work with the sanitation workers in Memphis, um, we said, all right, uh, perhaps the best thing we can do here was already on the Poor People's Campaign. We said, we must complete the campaign. He'd been taken from us, but we can't, we can't call uh, we can't call a stopping to that. The least we can do is go forward with the Poor People's Campaign uh, in Washington uh, to call attention to this question of poverty. And as he had said in the Riverside Church speech uh, a year earlier, for which he was, well, he lost his life a year to the day and to the hour that he made that speech, he said, uh, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It's in recognizing that a system that produces people, turns people into beggars, needs restructuring. And so the Poor People's Campaign was an attempt to lift up this poverty question, which was a regular day-to-day -day life of our society for so many millions of our, of our fellow citizens. And in fact, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it, it actually represented um, a, a, a continuation of what had been dropped before the, before the Cold War thing when President Roosevelt in 1944 uh, came forward with an idea of an economic bill of rights in which the idea of a socially useful work for people should be available for everybody uh, and, um, and that um, the right to work was a human right because people's life and sustenance depended upon the desire and the fulfillment of the right to have socially useful employment. Um, so the Poor People's Campaign continued, but because the staff picked up this immediately, there had been no time for, for reflecting upon what we had lost. There had been no time for real grief. And we were traumatized without really understanding the trauma. It was like one of these delayed reactions. Um, we had determined to carry on. We went to the funeral. We did everything that was necessary. But there came a time when we had to assess what was the larger mission that we were to dedicate ourselves to. And so there was just a long period in between there where um, we wrestled with that uh, because we know we had to, we know we had it to continue, but we also know that grief was holding up. And by the time you get to about 1970, there's a change in the country, of course, 
and uh, Nixon is in is in power, and the Cold War is in full full flowering, uh, and the Cold War w was a counter revolution that was determined to reverse everything that we had achieved, and so it, we were caught in this in this conflicting. Uh, situation where we know we had to carry on, but we had to determine what that form would be, and we had lost uh, a huge asset in the presence of Martin, and yet we know that uh, we had a, dedica a, a, a determination, we knew we had a, an obligation to him to carry out uh, the mission that he had identified, and when he had in his last speech had said he had been to the mountaintop, and he had seen the promised land. Uh, that was a, 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 an important metaphor for us because it meant, he said, I may not get there with you, but uh, you will get to the promised land. Well, we know we couldn't stand still. So uh, we said we would pick up and uh, see what we could do. The, now, I Bill, wanna, you had another part to that question. No, 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 that's good. I, um, I actually want to build on that. Because it, when you were talking, it made me think about this chapter uh, where there's a, re a report of the acting executive director, you, of the SCLC, given in November 1970. And this is a, a very serious critique. I don't mean it was a good critique. I mean it was, it was an intense critique of SCLC at that point. And I'm wondering now, do you think that SCLC was fundamentally incapable of going forward in the absence of King, or do you think that there were things that could have been done that weren't being addressed? I think we had every possibility for going ahead. I think we were faced, however, with um, a decline in support um, by the time you get to the 70s. The, the completion of the first stage of the delayed second reconstruction, that is with the, with the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 65, um, we had a war on our hands, but we had succeeded by the unity of the Civil Rights Movement and the Peace Movement to uh, affect a, an end to the draft. Uh, we had come through a, a very a very exciting period marked by the pain of assassinations. I think SDLC structurally had uh, one of the best teams in the world, one of the best teams you could imagine, people who were dedicated, experienced, uh, great history behind them, and great challenges ahead. But I also think that there were people within, within the organization, especially President Ralph Abernathy, who, uh, who really, you know, he wanted, he wanted to lead, but at the same time he had a, a difficulty in the sense of he, he wanted to be Mark. And you, could, you can't, we, we're, we're looking for a replacement for Mark. We were looking for uh, someone like us who, who, whose collective energy and commitment could carry us to the next stage of the struggle. Uh, the movement had lost some support by, by say, 1970s, early 70s, because the civil rights agenda in many people's mind had been completed. So we were repeating the experience of the abolitionist movement. When, when slavery was abolished, people didn't look at the second at Reconstruction. They said, well, you know, we joined this thing to abolish slavery. Uh, you all talking about Reconstruction? Well, you know, okay. But we're out of here. We're on to something else. We had the same quality of, uh, in terms of the context that we had in the, in the, in the overthrow of Reconstruction. We had a counter-revolution on our hands called the Cold War. It had placed uh, restrictions on people's ability to think and examine things because of the label of communists. And we also had people dropping off from what they considered the completion of the agenda of civil rights. 
So our team was together. We had uh, tested that strength uh, with the film record that uh, Eli Landau made. Uh, we turned out a million people to watch that film in uh, November, or sorry, March of 1970. Uh, a million people went to the film. It's called King of Film Records. Some of you will remember it. Uh, it was one of the earliest films on the civil rights movement by uh, Eli Lando. We had been very successful in 70 cities. Uh, and SCLC had the responsibility in 70 cities. We had tested ourselves out on that uh, and been very successful to raise money for the organization. Uh, we had helped Mrs. King uh, refinance uh, the, the, the King Center through this. Um, so we had a lot of confidence in what, in, in, in going forward, but we also had a, a cult of the individual uh, that uh, did, not, did not permit that. Uh, we, we regarded uh, President Abernathy as someone we would support to the hill, but we could not help but miss Martin. And uh, he just he just could not he just could not uh, fit into that proposition. Uh, Dr. King had named his, him as a successor. Uh, he was a fine man, Christian minister, uh, a nice person to know. But when we designed a program to redistribute our staff across the country, uh, he objected. The, the film had opened up our opportunity to be in places that we were not organized as SCLC before. And uh, we were quite prepared to do that because we felt that um, we needed a truly national organization uh, that was more than just in the South and Chicago, but across the nation. The nation was mourning the loss of Martin, and the nation had awakened to, uh, to the loss that it represented. And the, and the Vietnam War had awakened all of us to the interconnection between the struggle for civil rights and, and to end poverty and the terrible, uh, the terrible crime that the war represented, not only against, against the Vietnamese people uh, who had done us no harm, but, but against our, our best dreams for uh, an America uh, that was at peace with the world and uh, was, was, was carrying on uh, the program of, of a different America that addresses the problems of the poor. So uh, the net result was that some began to say, well, you know, I can do something else and I can continue in another venue. And um, the net result is that by 1973, uh, SCLC was still in existence, but had formerly, uh, you know, uh, much, much of the folks had gone to do other things. And uh, Andy Young had run for Congress, and Dorothy Cotton had become um, a leader of the student movement uh, in, uh, up, in, uh, up in upstate New York, and Jesse was setting up Operation Push. And so, you know, so people continued to, to work on the agenda of the time, the time that had surfaced in the wake of the assassination, but they had ascended, they, they had decided to, to work in different venue under different organizational affiliations. Um, so I can see that this interview could probably go on for about five hours. Um, because there's so much to cover. And uh, so I'm going to have to try to prune these questions because this is just plenty for us to consider. I want to jump back for a second, Jack, to uh, some Cold War related issues. And one issue that may be a bit controversial uh, that's mentioned in the book, but mentioned almost in passing was about the circumstances under which you left the Communist Party. Um, the question that I had was, it, it basically the, the book, the, the story as I understand it was that you left the Communist Party in order to devote yourself to the Civil Rights Movement. Why couldn't you do both? Was it a pragmatic decision that is an issue of time? 
Was there something that you felt that the Communist Party was not doing, that it needed to do? Um, because you've made it very clear that there was no ideological break, but something happened, and I thought that it would be useful to try to better understand that. The Communist Party was a party of dedicated Americans who made invaluable contributions that you would know about, Bill, and to the, to the, to the uh, labor movement. I had met them um, in the course of being in the labor movement. Um, I was in the National Maritime Union. I joined the Communist Party um, in the 1950s. In the 1930s and 40s, the Communist Party had been very important in organizing the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Um, uh, as a voter, I vote, a first-time voter uh, in New York in 1944, I had voted uh, for my for my person on the, on to be on the uh, city council. Benjamin Davis, a member of the Communist Party. Um, the Communist Party's contribution to the labor movement was indispensable, and yet I witnessed, uh, as a trade unionist, the expulsion of communists wholesale in uh, 1949 from the CIO, where a million members were uh, of the CIO were expelled in unions, were expelled from the CIO uh, on the grounds that they did not support the Marshall Plan. Uh, I, I was on the Marshall Plan for three years uh, and visited the countries of the Marshall Plan. Um, the United Nations had established the United Nations uh, Committee uh, on the Marshall Plan to rebuild the Marshall Plan and had assigned the, the mayor of New York, Fiorello LaGuardia, to be the head of that committee. Uh, Communists supported the rebuilding of Europe. They did not agree to do it through uh, the unilateral um, work of, 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 of the corporations of the United States. The corporations of the United States were, saw the Marshall Plan and helping Europe as a way of keeping the economy going. Uh, there were other ways to keep the economy going, but um, the fact is that the Marshall Plan was not designed uh, so much to put Europe back in place, but to guarantee that the economy is going. People went in debt uh, uh, under the Marshall countries. I, I saw taking uh, cotton to Egypt, when Egypt grows cotton, um, taking tobacco to Turkey from, from, from Virginia, when Turkey grows tobacco. I was on the Marshall Plan run. So you know, <laughs> uh, this was a serious. This was a serious situation. Serious in the sense that um, expelling a million members over foreign policy issue uh, was clearly an expression of the determination for corporate America to carry America in a different route. The the Cold War and its uh, fear campaign that was generated. Uh, passports taken, people fired from their job, um, House on American Activities Committee, who so-called exposing people, uh, people's passports lifted. So um, I had supported, I, I joined the Commerce Party in the 50s because the decision had come down by one vote from the Supreme Court that the Smith Act constitutional. Um, I, I, like millions of people, I didn't agree with that, with that decision, but that was the reality. Um, I knew something about the South. I had shipped out of New Orleans, and I became a member of the Southern Regional Committee of the party and uh, served there. Seven years later, in the late 50s, the Supreme Court, by one vote, had altered the Smith Act and it had declared it unconstitutional. And so um, I joined the Communist Party because uh, I felt a commitment, uh, like many people, that they, they needed help at that time. They needed 
the right the right to be themselves, the right to protest, the right to make their contribution uh, to the scientific uh, thought that was necessary for us to carry out all of the great potential that the defeat of fascism represented. The world was uh, standing quite prepared for a transformation uh, to a higher level of democracy. Uh, and uh, the United States, almost alone, had made the decision through its military industrial complex to resist and reverse that process. The communist parties were, were around the world were in the forefront of their countries. Uh, the communists in, in, in France, uh, you know, were the chief opposition to the war uh, against, the, against the people in Vietnam, the first war that people had to fight. Uh, I met communists in Cuba who supported uh, their New Deal type of government at the time because they said that government was, was a government of general progress for the Cuban people. They were quite flexible uh, in understanding uh, what needed to be done. So my, my relationship to the Communist Party in the United States was that I was a member uh, who wanted to be helpful. And when I saw the Civil Rights Movement take on a new life, because uh, we knew that if we didn't put up a fight to complete the agenda, what we talked about, the double V, the victory, victory over fascism, the victory over a kind of fascism at home would not be carried out. Uh, and so Ben Davis's party and Ferdinand Smith's party is the party I joined, and I tried to make a contribution. But when I saw that uh, our movement for for completing the second reconstruction uh, had taken on a new character in the sit-ins and the freedom rises. So I said, you know, um, I have the capacity to work in that and I'm going to do so. And so I went to a different venue uh, and offered my services to that venue because I felt what I had learned uh, as a seaman in traveling the world and in the Communist Party as a member of the of a party of scientific socialism, that I had something to contribute to the movement that was growing uh, because I knew that it would not be an easy transition. But we were part of the world. We had, uh, we had embraced what was going on in the world. Dr. King had been uh, to India and had discussions on nonviolence and, uh, and uh, had, had been at the, at the uh, had been to Ghana for the for the uh, for the victory of you know the, the independence of Ghana in 19, in, the 19, in 1956 and um, we had an internationalist viewpoint. Paul Robeson had uh, sung songs all over the world and had his passport taken and then in 1958. Uh, 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 Prime Minister Nehru had issued a proclamation in India that Paul Robeson's uh, passport, Paul Robeson's passport had been taken for things that we all believe in and called upon the Indian people to celebrate his, his uh, the contribution that Paul had made. I had met Paul at the NMU. He was an honorary member of our union uh, at the convention in 1947. All of these things tie into uh, an understanding that said, when this new movement emerged uh, in the late 50s and 60s um, that was confronting segregation with nonviolent direct action, I saw a future in that movement that I felt an obligation to help out with. And uh, I would leave the party to do that because I felt that that made sense. Hello. Do you, let me just pursue this one a little bit. Um, do you, did you feel that the party was not positioned to do what needed to happen at that moment? Um, and therefore you needed to move on? I mean, is that what in essence you were uh, grappling with? 
the party had been under siege for its contribution to the country in, in labor, civil rights, Scottsboro Boys. Um, the party had created, the party had been um, treated in such a manner by the authorities of the country that it would not experience, the, I didn't feel that it would experience the growth and the normalcy that I witnessed communist parties in Europe and other areas of the world. Um, when, when the United States took responsibility for the rebuilding of Japan, the Communist Party was legalized because the Japanese people would not permit uh, the, the new masters of, in Japan to outlaw the Japanese Communist Party because the Japanese Communist Party had been outlawed three times for its opposition to, to the imperial uh, foreign policy of, 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 the, of the Japanese government. Um, so I understood um, from a perspective of having a certain body of experience, I felt that I could be more useful to the, to the programs of democracy in our country, and it's particularly the civil rights movement, by being able to say I am not a member of the Communist Party, if it came up. There was great fear in the land, the House on Magnetism and the other things I'm talking about. So um, it was obvious that there were people who were known communists who did not have the mobility uh, to serve as they would have served, just as they had done in the 1930s when they were active in the trade union movement. Uh, people were frightened. People were burning their books in the backyard. Uh, uh, the House of American Activities Committee, uh, you could lose your job uh, for being called before it. The, the, uh, the, the, the Attorney General's subversive list uh, that non-communists and communists were subjected to, you know, you, you put on that list. The idea was there was a fear in the country that did not allow communists in, as communists to, to contribute to the country like they would desire to be. So that was just reality. It was not like, you know, uh, you didn't have to know too much about America to know that that was the case. Um, the, the, the people in Italy were electing communists left and right. Uh, in fact, the Italian Communist Party almost won the elections in 1948 for president. Uh, communists in France, uh, last time I talked with some friends of mine, in France, they had uh, 3,000 3, elected officials, mayors, head of provinces, school board members. We didn't have that luxury, and I knew it. So, and, uh, and others knew it, but I, I, yeah, I'm asking a question about Jack O'Dell. So I understood what rights a Communist Party should have and what rights the Communist Party that I had served in did not have. And so I took the choice to go into a movement that had, I, I, I believe we would, uh, we would have civil rights and an end to segregation before we would have socialism, but it's the same course of development. So you say I remained a firm leftist. Uh, thank you, it was a great compliment to me. I hope I have lived up to those standards. Uh, the Communist Party uh, and people I met there were some of the finest people in the world. But we live in America, and uh, capitalism in America was strong enough to create a counter-revolutionary environment in which uh, a white citizen council says that civil rights was communist. Well, one has to deal with that reality of, uh, with that reality of distorted understanding. You know, you can't just ignore that because the, the Smith Act was written by, for, by a man named Smith uh, who was in the Congress uh, from a district that blacks had been denied the right to vote. If, he had, if blacks had been denied the right to vote, he wouldn't even been there. But the Smith Act was named for him. That was the, the act that was used to persecute the communists. 
And, um, well, anyway, I just okay. want to make a long story short. There wasn't the opportunity to be as serviceable if you were in the Communist Party as if you took a different route and joined the movement that was creating the climate where all parties that served democracy would be legitimatized. You know, if we had some of the um, rights uh, that we claim uh, uh, leadership of the free world, uh, they, you'd be hard pressed uh, in Europe to find a country that doesn't have a communist party and a communist party that had elected officials. But we don't have proportional representation in the United States. Uh, but we're the leaders of the free world. So, you know, you learn a lot traveling and thinking and meeting people. And uh, I, that's why, I, uh, you know, I really encourage people to make it public. That's a long answer to uh, a question of great importance. Well, I appreciate it. So a few years later, you, you become an associate editor of Freedom Ways. And I don't know how much people... How much people today remember Freedom Ways or know about it? Um, could you just say a little bit about what you think its impact was in the black freedom movement? What happened to it? And is there anything that currently plays a similar role? I'll answer last first. I'm not aware of any uh, uh, periodical that does, but uh, I may be mistaken in that. Um, Freedom Ways was founded by Dr. Du Bois and Shirley Graham, uh, his wife, who was a children's book author, but just before they went to Ghana in uh, 1961. And um, this uh, magazine was taken over by Esther Jackson, who had been one of the founders of the Southern, Christ uh, Southern Negro Youth Council. I had been a uh, member of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Uh, you know, down in Miami when I lived there, when I was working on Operation Dixon uh, in the CIO. Uh, this magazine was uh, dedicated itself to be the magazine of the movement. Uh, that is, uh, a movement that with the scope and breadth of the struggle uh, for civil rights uh, and for an end to the insult of segregation, uh, a movement to, uh, to finally bring to an end the, the, the insult of Plessy versus Ferguson and affirm the dignity of African Americans. Uh, this, this, this magazine committed itself to be the magazine of that movement. And so in 1961, it was began with uh, Shirley Graham and uh, Esther Jackson and others. Uh, while I was uh, um, in, this, in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, a director of, it, of, um, of its uh, voter registration program. Um, Freedom Ways understood, first of all, it took as a point of reference that uh, we were completing the second reconstruction. And so the movement that was emerging in the South in Montgomery and elsewhere, but across the country against institutional racism uh, needed uh, a voice that would be the voice of that movement, where the experience that people were gathering in the movement in, in its many diverse forms would find a place to register these experiences so that people could study and be inspired and be informed and it would recruit people to the movement because of the interpretation of the experience and the ideas that we represented. And so that's what it set out to do. It was a quarterly journal, published four times a year in, uh, in New York. And um, it did a, num did a number of special issues. It had a special issue on uh, the South and the freedom movement at the time, uh, in the 1964, I believe it was. A special issue on Harlem because uh, our movement uh, uh, in the 60s was a continuation of the, the movement for dignity that the Harlem Renaissance had represented. 
and Harlan was a major center not only of the contemporary movement, but his history in the arts and the theater and so forth had been so important to us. Uh, we felt that the, having the opportunity to uh, bring these, these experiences from the past forward in the form of a, of a, of a, of a magazine would be very important. Uh, John Clark, uh, one of the editors, uh, uh, edited uh, a special issue on the Caribbean because uh, the Caribbean was uh, on fire, if you will, uh, in, in the struggle for freedom uh, all across the Caribbean uh, and uh, in both uh, music and art forms and political independence. Uh, the Caribbean peoples uh, who were uh, very much our cousins in terms of the Atlantic slave trade uh, were very much uh, a part of the world movement uh, for a new direction. The theme of the world at that time was a new period in world behavior was emerging as a result of the, uh, of the, of the disintegration of the colonial system. And uh, Freedom Ways uh, attempted to service that process in, uh, in the best way we could. So we published uh, for 25 years as a quarterly, and we never missed an issue. Um, uh, Ed, uh, Esther Jackson did a very important book earlier on, on Freedom Ways um, history, um, which uh, would be very interesting for all of your people to read, uh, because she, there was a listing of the number of people who contributed uh, to our articles at various times. And it's like a who's who uh, uh, of folks, both in, in the movement and in the intellectual life of our country. Um, in the 1980s, you were involved in the campaigns that Jesse Jackson ran for president in 84 and 88. And you and I and a lot of other people had had great hopes for that rainbow movement. I don't think any of us expected that Jackson was going to be elected president, um, but we had great hopes for that movement. And I'm wondering what lessons you have on this, and if you could share those with us, because I then want to jump to the today and talk about the Obama presidency in a second. So what, what were the lessons from those Jackson candidacies and what happened to the rainbow? The Jackson candidate was um, a candidacy that was very much on time. Uh, 1984, we were already in the ascendancy of the conservative movement, which uh, really began with the second election of Richard Nixon. Uh, Jesse Jackson uh, had formed a push in 1971 uh, to complete the civil rights agenda. But he also knew that uh, with all the things that were going on, uh, it was going to be necessary to, re to redefine the mission. And so we formed PUSH as a civil economics organization because the struggle for economic justice had now uh, taken, uh, had, now, had now surfaced as a paramount importance uh, in the struggle for equality. So we formed PUSH uh, as a civil economics organization. And um, the idea was that uh, we would use our consumer power to force the uh, various uh, corporations, big business and so forth, to hire African Americans. We deserved to be hired. We were qualified to be hired. But it was left uh, civil rights legislation lifted up to the goodwill of the corporations to hire and to, to, to stop the to segregation practices. Uh, segregation practices of last hired, first fired, had left us uh, with high unemployment as a way of life. And yet we had, uh, we had economic power that we had not used. So Jesse Jackson creatively recognized that uh, to, to bring into play our economic power, 
uh, as a civil economics organization, we would be able to affect very deliberately uh, the possibility for uh, improving our purchasing power, and, to, and, and it was part of lowering the barriers to our participation in other areas of life. That was a very important. Um, that was a very important uh, decision, because it laid the basis for building an all-class movement. Uh, black entrepreneurs who uh, who had small businesses um, and relied upon the black community would be included in the contracts that we would deal with uh, Coca-Cola and Wonder Bread and other corporations that they must, uh, they must hire qualified African Americans uh, as lawyers. There must be shelf space in their A&Ps and other uh, stores uh, for the products uh, of African American companies. Uh, and they must uh, make up their mind that uh, we are consumers that uh, spend money where our dignity is respected. So PUSH uh, developed chapters uh, all across uh, the country uh, around this issue. Some people would say, you know, that jumping, was issue to issue, jumping from issue to issue. J Jesse was identifying what was the issue that would galvanize the movement to take it to another stage of development. We were enjoying the right to go uh, in any restaurant, but you had to have the money to do so. We could uh, go to any college. Uh, we could uh, participate uh, widely, but the economic leverage, the economic um, discrimination that we had faced uh, was a factor that had to be overcome. And people became economic conscious. Uh, we, we, we picked up on where the movement had left off in uh, periods like this, uh, coming up on Christmas. We boycott stores during, during that time until they hired certain percentage of blacks uh, consistent with the, the type of uh, customers that we were. We set up a, 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 um, a research department of, uh, under uh, uh, Reverend Ed Riddick, uh, and he would research the money that we gave Coca-Cola last year based upon the different outlets it had. And we bring that to the people, say, you, you know. So we would have Saturday morning meeting in order to not conflict with the churches, and then we would, on Sunday, but our Saturday morning meeting, we would have a meeting and get inspired and then go out and pick it. Uh, and, and this was happening in cities across the country. So we developed a slogan that uh, on Sunday, you do church work, and on Monday night, you do, uh, and Sunday, after, Sunday night, excuse me, Sunday you do church work, and Monday you do the work of the church, which is to feed the hunger and clothe the unclothed and preach good news to the captive and study war no more. That started in the 60s, but we carried that through in the 70s and 80s and made it a Saturday morning meeting because people were off on Saturday, and if they come to a meeting of Bush, we had something to do on Saturday that was germane to our freedom. So. Um, that caught on, and uh, it, it developed across the country. And in that same period, you had a burgeoning right to vote to movement in some of these big cities, and the mayors of these cities were African American for the first time. Uh, Hatcher in Hatcher here in Gary, Indiana, and Carl, uh, in Cleveland, and Buffalo, and so forth. So this all came together, if you will, in a rather holistic uh, agenda. And uh, the Rainbow Coalition, the Rainbow Coalition was a reflection of that because uh, we had, Jesse Jackson had uh, gained great uh, credibility and, uh, and a presence in, on the world scene. Uh, we linked the foreign policy to our future because we found um, at the time that um, we, we found out at the time that uh, we were carrying on these activities, that uh, the, the American government was uh, extending its uh, 
relationship with the South African government. Uh, we took the first delegation of, of uh, peace activists and civil rights activists to the Middle East uh, in 19, uh, 1979. And um, then we found out that it was a no-talk policy toward the Palestinians. We met with the PLO. It extended, it just extended our vision, having a, a rainbow coalition and, and everything that led up to it uh, extended our vision of what was possible in a difficult time. People were being laid off in the steel plants uh, under uh, the idea of uh, bringing in new equipment. We made a trip out to Ohio. Uh, we saw uh, in some of the automobile factories, uh, people, we saw saw people being laid off the assembly line through speed up. Uh, we saw uh, people in the, uh, what you call it, in the, in the paint shop that were what, robots doing painting in the paint shop and that was somebody's job. Uh, it was a great educational experience uh, to, to have this breadth of activity going on uh, in the 70s and 80s. And the crystallization was that to form the Rainbow Coalition. It was a rainbow of people of every colors, if you will, of many persuasions who uh, had come together for peace and justice and the things that Martin and so many others had given their lives to. So I'm hesitating now in order to really grab the significance for us of what the rainbow represented. It represented guaranteeing that the 70s and early 80s had a movement character to it because uh, between the anti-apartheid movement that surfaced, the movement for peace, uh, it had to do with um, Vietnam at the time when the Vietnam War ended and we found ourselves uh, faced uh, before long with, with the, the war in Iraq. Uh, the peace and justice agenda was being challenged on all sides by the Cold War counter-revolution and the, and, and the Rainbow Coalition was our answer, both in terms of its form and its dynamic. We said that, uh, that peace and justice are indivisible. Jesse Jackson, as a rainbow candidate, went to Cuba and met Castro and talked about the conditions that the boycott was having and so forth. He went as a candidate uh, to Nicaragua other places in Central America. Uh, we took a delegation to South Africa because we wanted to test out how the South Africans felt about the, uh, about the, um, uh, the idea that maybe uh, the Sullivan principles that had uh, said, well, maybe we should just, uh, instead of calling for a complete boycott of South Africa, we should, and, and stop trading with South Africa, uh, we should just, uh, you know, have, have a boycott or use the Sullivan principles that a certain portion of, of American corporations operating in South Africa should hire South African blacks. And we went to South Africa to test that out. And uh, the South African brothers and sisters said, we are not trying to gain freedom for the 100,000 uh, South Africans who work for American corporations here. We're trying to gain freedom for 20 million South Africans, we don't want nothing to do with the Sullivan principles. We came back and talked with Reverend Sullivan and said, no, we, our movement cannot be identified with the Sullivan principles. As well-intentioned as they are, they are not the issue. They are not addressing the issue. And, uh, and Reverend Sullivan graciously said, I understand. And from this point on, we will support what the South African people want. Uh, the, um, so, so these, these examples kept the African-American community on the world scene 
as as persons of concern, and the, and the the rainbow were our allies for peace. But just the farmers in the Midwest, uh, the the Arab Americans who came on, uh, because of our our, our uh, uh, situation uh, position on the Middle East, uh, the women's movement because we supported the absolute equality of women. The rainbow became the bandwagon that. Uh, that we placed, and the, the actually, the point of reference for the fundamental changes that were needed in our country, the fundamental changes that would uh, allow us to be the democracy that we had been claiming to be, but were falling far, far, far short of. But now, Bill. Yeah. Yes. Just in terms of. So we have these elections, and in 88, we had a very significant Jackson campaign that won millions of voters, all these primaries. Um, in, by the end of 1988, despite Bush's win in the election, there were many of us that thought, okay, Bush won, but still we have this rainbow movement. And then in March of 89, you know what happened. Basically, it, it, certain decisions were made to change it around. So what do we conclude? We conclude that the rainbow coalition, this is my conclusion, that the Rainbow, and I think it should be the conclusion that we should consider, the Rainbow Coalition had established, first of all, it had established an agenda for the Democratic Party. Uh, that agenda was all of the issues that the Rainbow represented of germ that were germane for our time, that were consistent with what Dr. King had spoken about at the Riverside Church speech, uh, ending militarism, uh, taking up part in peace, in, in the peace of in establishing the world. Uh, the rainbow had a philosophy uh, of, of not only full employment, full employment at socially useful work um, and, and livable wage. So this had crystallized. So this was the, this was the new plateau upon which to build the struggle for democracy and peace. Uh, and to carry it forward in the context of a situation that was marked by the growth of the military industrial complex in the United States and the election of Ronald Reagan as a spokesman for a conservative movement that said that uh, government was the problem, government was not the solution. The, the, the leadership of the Democratic Party recognized that the, wrong, that the Rainbow Co Coalition represented a direction that it didn't want to go in. Uh, the, 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 the situation that had emerged in our country called the Cold War, this, this uh, fear, uh, thought control, militaristic arrogance, uh, which, which I say was, uh, was, was really a, another, uh, was a danger, what, 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 let me put it this way, a counter-revolution in the world. This counter-revolution had made great inroads in the Democratic Party, and uh, in the, the, the conservative element was operating in both parties, Republican and Democratic Party. And so this, this, the Rainbow Coalition represent the crystallization of a, an attitude that said we need to pick up where the Rainbow, where the New Deal left off and where the Civil Rights Movement just completed in terms of the right to vote and the right to in the right to access to public accommodations. This is the next stage. 
so we not only had a candidate for the new direction and an agenda. All three existed in the rainbow. And as you indicated, Bill, uh, Jesse Jackson finished first in 12 states and finished second in 32 states. Uh, that's, that's the most serious challenge of a progressive candidacy in the Democratic Party since the end of World War II. Uh, Jesse Jackson was a serious black candidate, and that was a plateau that had been reached. The Democratic Party decided that um, one way to accommodate this was to um, leave the impression that we should be an inside, that we should be in the party, not an independent force outside the party. And we had had that debate at the convention. And the convention had voted that we would, uh, we're, we're Democrats, but we also are a movement. And we will pressure the Democratic Party like we would pressure any other party to complete an agenda. We had, we will vote Democrat with consistency because uh, many black elected officials are Democratic Party members. And, um, but we, are, we, 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 we really, we are a movement that operates within the party as an electoral strategy and outside the party uh, as a progressive movement with its own life characteristics and uh, momentum and energy because we were determined that it must grow. Uh, uh, folks with this kind of an agenda have to become the dual authority in the country and not just rely upon whatever authority uh, that comes from elected officials. We had, in short, what you might call a dialectical approach to the question. Um, Reverend Jackson understood this, uh, but he also saw something else. He felt that the Democratic Party could best be um, carried through, that the, that the rainbow could best be carried through by remaining uh, solid Democrats. The uh, Democratic Party agreed to uh, 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 nominate some rainbow people to uh, the Democratic National Committee. We didn't oppose it. That's fine. Uh, they made concessions. But the concessions uh, did not contribute well to the to the development of the energy, then they were not designed to, to develop the energy and independent thrust of the Rainbow Coalition. And so we didn't proceed to uh, set up any further uh, chapters. Um, and there was great disappointment all across the line. Uh, Jesse became a, a figure in the Democratic Party that did a lot of good. Uh, caused a lot of things to take place within the Democratic Party uh, based upon his uh, prestige and intelligence and hard work. But the dialectic and the energy that having a force outside. Now, Push still does a lot of good work, but um, much of the energy that came from the constituents in the Rainbow Coalition uh, have, are, are in decline, you know. We didn't win the battle for the farmers in the Midwest, and that was our challenge. Um, the nation has gone backwards on affirmative action. The, the new crisis we're in today, um, we, we, we need a rainbow type of, of, of development that um, puts the pressures on the Democratic Party and, 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 and poses the question of, a, a social change of such magnitude that we would be prepared to institute a new party because the, this party, the Democratic Party we're dealing with, increasingly looks very much like the Republican Party. The Republican Party is tightening up and the Democratic Party uh, under the Clinton mentality uh, is trying to show how you know it can uh, 
and can get along. Well, we're for getting along with people with principle, but there are principles involved, and our nation is suffering from a narrower strategy of, uh, of not having an independent force. The closest thing we have to it are the, are the caucuses within the Democratic Party, like the Progressive Caucus and the, and the Black Caucus, the Latino Caucus. They do, they do good work, and, and uh, they do good work in the Democratic Party. But the need today is an independent force that can set, the, can, can set the momentum, set the pace, set the vision, uh, and set the hope. Uh, keep the hopes high, because people are going through changes today that there needs to be an independent source for them to turn to that can help them get off this role of being kicked out of their homes under this toxic mortgage thing. Yet. Uh, put up a fight for uh, carrying out uh, the law we passed that said that the, the, the country should have 4% unemployment uh, across the board in every city, county, and district in the country. 4%. At the time that was passed in 1979, there hasn't been a single administration in this country that has carried out that, that law, uh, the Humphrey Hawkins bill that there was 4% unemployment, passed in 1979. So we're way behind. We've fallen way behind in the democratic, the democracy agenda, because the Democratic Party is not committed primarily to the democracy agenda. The Democratic Party is committed to getting along with the Republicans in carrying out the corporate agenda. We need a new movement that is committed to the things that that the, that uh, that uh, our movement, led by Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition, represented. We we need that today. Thank you, Jack. I'm gonna turn it back over to Nikhil. Thank you, Jack. Um, thank you so much, and let's just please have a round of applause. I don't ask for applause. One of the things that um, Bill just had the experience of, that I've been having the experience of for many years, is that when one interviews Jack, every question can take you into um, really incredibly detailed and uh, complicated discussions about, about history, about politics, about strategy, and about uh, where we go from here, so about the future. And um, I actually have about a 350-page interview transcript of, of interviews I've done with Jack over the last few years. And Jack saves everything, and all his personal papers are going to be going to the, the Schomburg Library, where, where, they're, where they're currently on their way, I think, in, in various shipments. And uh, the book that we put together, which is, uh, I'm told, on sale here, um, uh, and I hope you consider buying it and reading it, uh, is, is just a start, it's just a beginning point um, to uh, the kinds of inquiries that I think you can see from the, the rich conversation we've been having today already um, uh, can, can go in many, many different directions and be expanded. And I know there are a lot of students here that are researching uh, aspects of, of the history of the black freedom movement that I, I hope this was uh, stimulating for you. We wanted to provide about um, 15, 20 minutes for people who uh, want to make comments or, or ask questions to Jack um, based upon what you've been hearing or, or, or based upon anything that you're thinking about right now um, to do so. So, um, so I think we can take another, another uh, 20 minutes and try to, try to wrap up about 5 o'clock. Um, I, think, I think if you want to ask a question, you, you may want to come up here and speak into the microphone so that Jack can hear you, if you don't, if you don't mind. And then we can also get it recorded on, the, uh, on the, the, the record of the conversation that we're having. So, so please, please come up if you have a question and speak into, introduce yourself and speak into the microphone. Hello, Jack. My name is Nick Powers. Uh, I'm a professor at SUNY Old Westbury, and I teach African American literature. And my question is that on the night of the election, um, I remember seeing Jesse Jackson's face 
uh, and uh, he was both very proud. Uh, the tears were streaming down. And even though he had critiqued uh, then Senator Obama uh, before, and it seemed that during the campaign, Obama took a lot of the rhetorical, uh, a lot of the rhetorical images and concepts from Jesse Jackson's presidential campaigns. Uh, but it seems now that his president, his presidency, has deviated very far from those ideals. And how do we imagine now the direction and the goal of the progressive movement? Uh, you said before that we need an independent party. What are the I force? What are the images that could galvanize, or how do we begin to build or imagine that new force? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, obviously, that's 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 a question that we all ought to be talking about together. <laughs> um, but I think the core of your question is the recognition that uh, our movement must take charge of the new direction. Uh, uh, President Obama has inspired people to vote for change. He has uh, he has made the type he has made he's made the idea of a new direction uh, a recognized necessity. But the responsibility for that new direction has to be in the hands of a, of a movement of integrity and intelligence and commitment that recognizes that there has to be a dual authority in the country, the authority of the government, the presidency, the cabinet, and the authority of the people. We have, that's, that's missing in our present time. Every area that we are now struggling uh, that we identify as broken, health care, the housing crisis, the, the school situation, um, every area, the, the, the question of, of, of food, uh, the situation in, in, in our communities, uh, one third of the children in Harlem have, 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 have asthma. Uh, all of these areas that we say are broken have dedicated people who are working day and night to correct the situation. They have come together to some degree or another around the candidacy of 2008 that said, let's go in a new direction. It's our responsibility now to take that seriously and to uh, find ways and means of rebuilding community having the opportunity to exchange ideas on what the best different methods are in these areas, but remembering always to connect the movement's agenda to some type of electoral activity. Because the government, the kind of government we live under does matter. It can implement things or he can turn things around and cause things to go backward. Uh, but to recognize that the, that being the President of the United States has great possibilities, but it is no substitute for a movement. And all of us have ideas about how that movement can be built. We need to enhance the conversation uh, through such agencies as Democracy Now! Uh, and other such communication centers. We have um, uh, this new grouping of African American and Latino uh, uh, people in the media who have an organization of their own of several hundred activists uh, sitting down with them and working out how the ideas that are coming out of the movement's experience can get multiplied and projected across the country so that we can share them. All things are possible. You know, there's a slogan about uh, the, uh, a new world, uh, a new world is, is possible. Uh, and there's another idea that's been added to it, another America is necessary. Now we must, that, that, there's a, they must fuse those two things because it is a different world we need to deal with. This world that is now the captive of finance capital, we must keep in mind that uh, there was a struggle against fascism in the 1930s and 40s that defined what this fascism is. And they defined it 
as, as the brutal terroristic rule of the most racist, most militarist sections of finance capital. When these boys can walk away with billionaires uh, for having robbed people, uh, is something we must give attention to. But, um, but that's not up to the president. That's up to us. It is up to us, it's up to us to set the tone so that the president, if he wishes to be part of this movement, can say, you know, these are the things that I meant when I said a new direction, and the, mo the people are speaking. We have precedents for this, going all the way back to Roosevelt. The CIO made the New Deal. They, they sat down in those factories and said, you know, and that's what got the Wagner Act. Uh, Kennedy came in saying, well, we want to go to the moon. We said, that's cool if you want to go to the moon, but they got some problems here on Earth. And then you got to deal with the sit-ins, the freedom rides, and so forth, created a dual authority. What's missing now is that we have not yet created the dual authority, but we have the coalition that elected President Obama present, capable of doing that. Hi, Jack. It's Van Goss. I'm, I'm reflecting on the fact that you're out there in British Columbia, right up against Alaska. And I'm wondering, <laughs> and I, you know, I grew up in rural America for a good part of my life, but I still, I, I'd like to know your take on why Governor, ex-Governor Palin, is so extraordinarily popular with at least, you know, some of the American people. What is going on there? And I, you know, I was someone who sort of rejects everything we thought politicians, competent politicians, were supposed to stand for. How does it look to you out there? Well, I'm in the same boat you're in. <laughs> I'm wondering, too. But I'll tell you one thing. Um, well, there's two things I think I, is important. One is that people are hurting. And the, the pain that people are feeling around unemployment and the loss of uh, jobs and the, uh, the loss of uh, pensions, this is, this is a very difficult period for millions of people. And it's across the country. We have come through a period in the United States where the concept has been planted, uh, when I say planted, in the popular mind that government is not a solution to the problems. Government is part of the problem. Uh, Reagan said that openly, but the, the policies that we have seen for the last 20 years, of both Republicans and Democrats, has, has been reflective of the fact that uh, it is big business who is our savior. They provide the jobs and they provide the wealth, et cetera, et cetera. Sarah Palin is, in my opinion, just a reflection of that phenomenon. The conservative movement has been on the ascendancy, as I said, since the, since the 70s. And it is being contested but it has been on the ascendant. So we face 30 years of a gen where the general characteristic has been the application of, of conservative ideas and ser conservative so-called so remedies to our predicament as a society. Uh, the, the people of the United States lost $11.6 trillion in this recent collapse. Uh, and it's 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 called it's still called a recession. Um, so what's going on here is what's going on all over the country. People are trying to find a uh, foothold to reverse this plan. Capital capital uh, Canada is in somewhat better condition um, than the United States, but it it has a conservative government that very much wants to be uh, very much part of the globalized 
uh, process and mentality that the conservatives in the United States do. We have a we have a uh, we have a premier here, prime a prime minister, who won when he was elected. Um, he went to see George Bush before he was sworn in. So you know this tells us a lot. Canada has undergone some serious changes in the last, say, 10 years. Uh, we've had this war along with the United States in Afghanistan and Iraq for 10 years now. Uh, the United States has spent a trillion dollars in this war against, uh, in the case of Iraq, a country that we know has never done us on. And, uh, the reason for being there has, has been proven false than a big lie technique. So it's a, diff it's a difficult period. Um, but it's one also that is marked by the fact that more and more people are coming to question what is going on. And therein lies the hope. There is an awakening here, here in Canada and in the United States. It has got to be speeded up. It has got to take on depth. It has got to take on a degree of honesty because, um, as Dr. King said, I remember a long time ago, what, what does our movement hate, hope to accomplish? He, he was asked a, 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 a reporter, uh, and, and Dr. King said, we hope to appeal to a nation that has a new consciousness and a new conscience. This is what we're working on, a new consciousness and a new conscience, because America that's a necessity for America. Another world is possible, but another America is essential. And the one we have been trapped in, so to speak, has not taken, has not taken seriously the problems that our attitudes and our policies have caused all over the world. Uh, it's almost impossible not to have give a kind of long answer. But what's happening here in Canada is, is, is a reflection of what's happening in the United States. A conservative movement has, um, has taken hold in many areas. Uh, Alaska used to have some pretty good people. They had a brother there in Senate that was one of the few people that, 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 opposed, that opposed the war in Vietnam early on. Um, so there's some work needs to be done there. The farmers, you know, we have a farm population that has been seriously hurt. Um, I can remember with the farmers movement that we had uh, in, in, in 1980s, well, you know, they, they, uh, the, 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 the farmers in Illinois and, and, and uh, Minnesota, Iowa. And Iowa were very active in the and they wanted to remain farmers, not get pushed off the land and be the victims of corporatized farming. So we are in a period that is marked by an awakening among the public, but awakening um, among the conservative element that they must go to the next stage of their effort to, to, to colonize uh, us with a corporate mentality and a corporate set of policies that will carry us in this direction of, 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 of the wealthy getting, a, getting, getting everything and the working poor remaining poor. Um, well, I won't go further than that, but I'll add a couple of things later. Okay, I think I actually think we're gonna we're gonna wrap wrap this up, Jack. If there's maybe one final question anyone has, otherwise we'll we'll, we'll I think um, just ask you to say uh, maybe if you have any any last thing you you'd like to say. I'll just I'll just point to one one thing uh, in the book. Uh, one of the things that we did with the book, in addition to publishing many of Jack's most important writings in the organizational documents, Jack also wrote uh, a new a new piece for the book, a very substantial piece, which really reflects on the long history of un what we might call unfinished reconstructions. The, the first reconstruction was left unfinished. 
The second reconstruction was left unfinished. So what is the nature of the contemporary reconstruction that we need to try to reinitiate and this time finish, I think is one of the questions that he's asking. And he's also included a very important document that's been circulating and become part of a number of discussions in different communities and organizations called the Democracy Charter, where, uh, where Jack lays out uh, uh, many dimensions of what the contemporary struggle for mass democracy uh, uh, needs to take into account in the current situation. So, um, so in other words, the book is, is meant to engage both this, this long and complicated past that is still so richly important for informing our sense of what we need to do, and it's also about trying to uh, think about uh, looking forward. And so I would just ask you, Jack, maybe um, in closing to, to say a couple of final words, um, and, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll let people uh, mingle here in New York and, um, and uh, hopefully buy some books. Unfortunately, you're not here to sign them, but uh, I know you're here in spirit. So uh, do you want to say a couple of final words? Well, I'm very happy to have a chance to talk with all of you uh, today. I wish we had had more time, and I guess I took too much time in, in some of the answers. No, not at all, Jack. This was a fabulous but, uh, interview. But I really would like to have heard more from, um, from your questions. But I think, I think the, the essential thing today is to recognize um, that we have a future if we take it into our own hands. We have a future that we can build upon of peace and justice in the world and in our country. Uh, we have a great tradition of, um, of support for life and it's flourishing around the world. Um, today is a very challenging time because our country is still going in the wrong direction. But we, the people of the United States, have to take responsibility for that reality. And that reality can be changed. It can be changed because of the integrity and the intelligence and the commitment and the energy that we're proposed, that we're, that we're prepared to give to it. it. We should be thinking long term as well as short term. We have to rebuild community step by step because our communities have been devastated by unemployment and, and, uh, and all forms of crisis. But the rebuilding of them is the energy for hope and an energy that will keep our young people uh, looking to the future because we want to have something to pass on to them that will enable them to feel that they too are part of our world. Um, this is 2010, 2012 is upon us, but 2016 and 2020 are also upon us. We must have a long-term view. We did not get in this situation overnight and we will not come out of it overnight, but we will come out of it. God bless all of you. Thank, Thank you. you for being here today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks again to the Brecht Forum, and thanks especially for, to, to Bill Fletcher for conducting this really extraordinary interview, which I think will be available and be a part of the, the archive that is uh, very, very important and will, I'm sure, circulate well beyond this room. And thank you again to Jack O'Dell. Thanks, Jack. Okay. You still there, Jack? We're still here, buddy. Okay, we're not. Rec I just wanted to uh, let you know that this was this was all recorded, and I, I hope that's okay. I think it was a. Oh, that's fine. Yes. It was an amazing interview, Jack. It was terrific. Just terrific. Well, I'm certainly happy that I could have shared it shared this day with everybody yeah uh, it's well, been a it's been a wonderful it's been a wonderful experience and uh i'm looking forward to other occasions when we can get together physically yeah we will i'll be in vancouver I'll be next month traveling, you know. yeah, I'll, I'll come up and see you and jane next month as you know oh, good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so we send love to all and um, thanks to all of you for all the work that you're doing you you you're affirming what is possible in our country. 
we, we are part of the world. <laughs> and uh, we know that as we bring forth the best in our tradition, we will build allies and we will build friends and we will have a world that we share with all peoples everywhere for they are our brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for this day. Okay, thank you. Okay, take care, Tony. Bye-bye, Indian.